What's up guys, Smash Adams here, and today I'm going to do an updated deck profile on Monarchs. Now, considering that the ban list hit the deck pretty hard, it's um, it, was, it was no surprise that it lost a lot of synergy, but it also forces you to kind of run an entirely different engine to make the deck flexible enough to compete. The deck's not dead, you just got to do your research and see what works. Now... The only shocker for me was when they hit Aether. That's when I was like, wait, 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 what? I could have seen Domain getting hit over Aether, but I'll be blunt with you guys. Aether was just as good as the rest of the key cards to the deck, and I figured it was it was only a matter of time before they were going to hit it anyway, so I figured, yeah, I mean, it, it's reasonable why they hit it. But Monarchs are alive and well. People still play them to this day, even though there are some that say, oh, the deck is dead now that they hit it, you might as well just hang it up. No, you just gotta do whatever it takes to make it flexible enough to compete. And sure enough, this is the result you get, and it works out great. So, I'm gonna show you all the deck, explain a couple of my tech choices, and without further ado, here is Monarchs. To start off, of course, we've got, of course, three Erebus, the Underworld Monarch. Now you are heavily relying on him more so than Aether, since of course Aether is limited, and most of your key plays are, if not going to come off of Aether, but more so on him, because he is heavily reliant on the whole shuffling ability, and the cool thing is too, is that you can sit on him first turn if need be, and then if you have no main, you have no worries, so shuffling a card on your opponent's side of the field or in their hand, and since it's an immediate effect, the cool thing is it doesn't target. And after that, with Domain on the field, you can shut them out of getting cards from their extra deck. So you have no worries until later on. And next we got, of course, one Aether. Sadly, it's hit one, but hey, you gotta roll with it. And it's still good so that we can spam out whatever you want, Monarch-based or whatnot, and then get your plays going later on in the duel. But this card was broken for a reason, guys. Usually, this was a first turn play, then you can do this, send Monarch spells or traps from your deck straight to the graveyard, and then get another Aether from your deck straight to the field, add that Aether straight to your hand, do another play with that Aether, and then, like, on their turn. Um, look, I'm not going to break it down to you guys. This, car this card was good for a reason, so I figured that they were going to limit this card sooner or later, so it was better to do it sooner. Next we've got Triple Karaz. Now with the deck losing a lot of leverage, you are kind of forced to run cards that have to be maximized as far as um, drawability or just adding pluses. And this is one of the cards that does so. Originally, I was going to cut it down to one and add something else, but I figured running the third one was more beneficial since it does help you gain in, like as many draws as you can, depending on whatever you pop on either side. But needless to say, it's going to help you in the long run. Even though it can't attack on the turn it's summoned, uh, Karaz is still pretty good. Next we've got one Thestalos and one Caius. Uh, not only because of the whole burn ability with each, but mainly due to the fact that they're the main ones that you would run in the deck. Uh, usually a lot of folks run Thestalos over Caius, or just run one over the other. Or just run both, but I figured running both would be the better option in case if one if I if one uh, was happened to able to be um, either negated or just destroyed overall, I can have another option to fall back on, get another monarch, and then some. And the cool thing is with Caius is that you can easily abuse him since you have a high majority of dark monsters in your deck anyway to spam off of. And um, needless to say. Both of these effects will uh, benefit you in any situation. Usually the first turn play with the Stalos is really, really broken compared to this. You usually use him, like, if not late game, but on a second turn play, if need be. And then, of course, for the non-monarchs, we've got one v Majesty's Fiend and one Vanity's Fiend. Usually these two together set up a lock, even though a lot of people say... Uh, a few times out of ten, it's um, highly impossible to get both of them on the field. But depending on what you get, you can actually get a really good playoff with both of them on the field. And it, it can be done. All you really need is a flexible hand. Like, say, if you get a one-for-one one and an 80 and an 8 and all that. And if you get a return, uh, hands down, you're going to be getting a bunch off. Usually, but usually if you get the Vanity Swing off first and then get this off, you got a lock. No special summons, no monster effects. Pretty good. 
And um, they're like the most flexible tribute summon monsters in the deck. Although you can't fetch out Vanity Sphine as easily as you would with Majesty Sphine upon return, uh, still, you want to run it because you want to shut down Pendulums, you want to shut down Burning Abyss. This is also good against Burning Abyss too since they are heavily reliant on graveyard abilities and monster effect abilities. Because let me be honest with you, monster effects are what's helping decks become flexible as they are now and in the current format and later on in the future. But needless to say, these are good for shutting down any resources that are reliant, if not on monster effects, but on special summons as well. And pendulums count as well. So, yeah, these are pretty good. The dynamic duo of monarchs right here. And then, of course, for the vassals, we've got the triple Eda. Basically, to set up your tribute summon plays with Eidos, and then just get your monarch plays going, or just get them off with uh, Majesty's Fiend or anything of that nature, and then just sit on those cards later on, and then get whatever you need to kind of set up your field to protect your monarchs and whatnot. And next we've got three Eidos, because they're good Allure, Allure of Darkness fodder, and they're good tribute targets for whatever you have, Monarch based, or uh, Majesty or Vanity based. Uh, but more so for the Monarchs, since you're going to be heavily reliant on getting a bunch of your plays off with the Monarchs. And the cool thing is you can banish it, get your Edia back, sp banish, I mean, tribute it, sorry, tribute it with, um, with a, for a Monarch, or anything that involves tribute summons, get back one of your Monarch spell or trap cards from the banished zone straight to your hand. Usually it would be the Pantheism, and then some. So, this card's pretty good, next to Edia. So running three of these is, my in my opinion, never a gimmick. I was going to add a land robe in the deck, but I figured the one Mithra would do just fine for now. And the main reason why is because it's free compared to the rest of the vassals. I've tried Garum and land robe and this combined in the deck, but I figured just running this one on its own was enough since it's it counts as an extra vassal and... Like I said, it's free. The only downside is you have to give your opponent a token. But the cool thing is it acts a little bit like Eidos, but the difference is you get an extra tribute summon off of that play. So, um, yeah, Mithra's pretty good. I might run a second one in the future. We'll see. And that's it for the monsters. Now on to the spells. We've got Triple Domain. You know what this guy does. Uh, the minute you get a Monarch, the minute you get something that involves tribute summons... You shut your opponent out of the extra deck. Since you don't have to worry, since Monarchs are not reliant on the extra deck as much, uh, you are pretty much in the clear. So whatever you have, you've got what you need, especially with Domain. And the cool thing is, during your battle phase, your Monarchs or whatever you use to tribute summon with, they gain 800 attack points during your battle phase. Sadly, it won't work on your opponent's turn, but still, it's a good card to just shut your opponent out of the extra deck. Three, Tenacity, to basically recruit whatever Monarch spells or traps you want. Two, Return. Usually, you would maximize this to three, but I wanted to add something else to kind of add some support to protect my Monarchs. And then next, we've got, sadly, the one Pantheism, because you can only run one. But you can still get it back with some of the places that you're going to be getting off anyway. And, sadly, one Stormforth, because... This was a, it was a soul exchange on crack. The downs, I mean, the difference between that and soul exchange is you could attack with this after you use the uh, tribute summon and all. But uh, Stormforth was a pretty broken card for Monarchs or anything that involved tribute summons. So if you had nothing to fall back on, you can use this. And the cool thing is it didn't target either. So that was the other reason why they had to hit it. So, I mean, yeah, it was pretty good. So um, next we got one tech of March of the Monarchs. Good for protecting your Monarchs, good for protecting your Majesties and your Vanities Fiend. Anything that involves Tribute Summons, this card is really, really, really good. So if they say Raigeki, not happening. They say uh, 101, any of that stuff, nope, not going to happen. So um, anything that targets or can't, or that targets or destroys, guess what? Your Monarchs are safe from harm, so you really have no worries. One tech of Frost Blast. It's basically a Galaxy Cyclone for the deck. And the cool thing is, you can activate it from your graveyard as well. But you have to banish a Monarch Spiller Trap card as well with this card to, in order to use it. And then destroy another set card in, in, in the process. And then for the rest of the deck, we got... Well, for the spell lineup, rather. 
3 Allure of Darkness because you're kind of forced to running an entirely different engine, which requires a lot of draw power and synergy. And this card kind of, um, it basically makes that work. So with the amount of darks that you run, you shouldn't have a problem getting as many pluses as you want. And then, of course, we've got 1-1 one, one for 1 to get to your EDF faster and then do some quick tribute summons and all. One Rota to get to your um, EDF from the deck straight to the hand. Well, you're going to be, though you're more reliant on using this than the Rota, it's still good to run them both in case you need other options to fall back on if you don't get the one for one fast enough. And, of course, one Foolish Burial, since you are now heavily reliant on Erebus to get your plays going. So, um, yeah, needless to say, you got to have a, an option to fall back on with this card since you are going to be relying on Erebus more so than Aether. Uh, Aether, I mean, Erebus is the go-to guy now, guys, since, of course, Aether is at one. So, sadly, yeah, you got to rely on something with Foolish Burial. And then for the traps, we've got two Escalation. I might run a third one, but I'm not sure what to take out. So I figured two was balanced enough. In case I ever needed it last minute, this would be a good card to go for, for, like, Tribute Summons on my opponent's turn. And, of course, to round it off, we've got two Prime Monarch, pretty much as a secondary tribute for whatever I choose. And then, the and the cool thing is, is if I have it in my Spell of Trap card zones, I can activate it, recycle back whatever Monarch Spell of Traps that I have in my graveyard, and then get a plus one. It's really, really good. So, um, needless to say, it's a pretty good card uh, to uh, to tribute off of, needless to say. So, that's it for the Monarch deck, guys. Hope you all enjoy this little deck profile that I put together. Please leave a like and favorite if you enjoyed. If you have any suggestions, leave them. I'm open to them. Now, within the next couple of days, I might make a couple more deck profiles revolving Monarchs, but it's going to be outside of running Aether and Erebus. But, We'll see where that goes. Anyway, hit me up in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe. And until next time, this is Smash Adams signing out.